Well, good morning. Welcome once again to Word for the Week, our online book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church. My name is Pastor Jeremy, and I'm uh, very excited to be with you today as we take a look at um, chapter uh, 8 of J. Payleitner's book, uh, The Prayer of Agar. Uh, today, in, uh, actually, we're going to take a look at chapters 8 and 9 today. So uh, today, um, uh, Payleitner uh, is at the, the end of uh, Agar's prayer, uh, and he's, he's going to start to reflect now on what Agar says after uh, he has led us through this prayer. And ultimately, Jake Payleitner uh, points out that there's a, a series of lists that Agar develops. Um, he, he has a, a list about satisfaction um, and contentment. He has a list about uh, some amazing, um, what he calls enigmas, uh, amazing things that happen in, in, in the way of life, in the way of the world that are maybe sometimes uh, inexplicable, but absolutely um, proven in our lives. He has a list of uh, uh, th uh, human mistakes, things that we continue to do wrong. Um, there's small wonders. There are uh, kings and in, in the incredible way that they, they fall from their power. Um, and, and so there's all these different lists that Agar sort of uh, brings up. The purpose of those lists is to remind us very clearly of God's sovereign rule over every single moment in our lives. Every little detail is, um, has been coordinated, has been, um, we would say, sort of foreordained by God. Now that doesn't mean, uh, right, we're, we're going to get into a little bit of theology or what we call ontology, the, the, the study of how God works and moves and, 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 uh, and works with his people. The, the ontology here doesn't mean that um, God is somehow like a, a chess player where he's up uh, in heaven moving strategically uh, pieces on a board. Um, that isn't the function of God. The function of God is that he has foreordained, he has preordained, he has already set into motion uh, the things of this world. And yes, he does know today what you're going to do tomorrow. And he has already begun to prepare for that. And, and I believe he's begun to prepare you for that uh, or prepare me for what's going to happen tomorrow. But that doesn't mean that he's somehow not involved in what's happening. And so there may be uh, situations, um, for example, Jonah, uh, where um, God had an intention of uh, sort of you know, wiping the Ninevites from the face of the earth because of their sin. Uh, and when they repent, it seems like God changes his mind. He doesn't change his mind. He, he makes accommodations that he had already had in his plan should uh, the people use their free will and actually choose to repent. And, and so the reality of um, these lists is that, again, it's not about God uh, moving us as chess pieces. He's not some sort of uh, watchmaker who has built a watch, wound it up, started to take to ticking, and then left it, you know, and never interacted with it again. God is always interacting with us in our lives, and I think that's critical, especially when we think about what Payleitner has talked about in chapter 80. He's talking about humility, and so that, that humility, he says, is what allows us to trust God and keeps us on the straight path instead of careening from side to side. When we focus on our own relationship with a trustworthy God, there's no reason to blame, dishonor, castigate, or disparage those around us. But when we show signs of self-importance and stop trusting God, we allow ourselves to be tempted by lies and distracted by our earthly desires, and we start to panic. That's what we get for leaving God's sweet spot. Um, I think the difficulty of the sweet spot that God has for each and every one of us is that it requires an incredible act of humility on our part in order to, first of all, get there, and then secondly, stay there. Uh, it requires things that we don't like as humans, humility, um, contentment, satisfaction with uh, what we have. Uh, and if you think about just those three things, uh, our sinful human nature, our world, is so opposed to those things. Um, humility, we, we like to be number one. We like people to think 
uh, the very best of us, and, and, and we like to be in control and in charge and, and all of those things. Um, when it comes to contentment, there's always stuff we want more, uh, we want more of, or, or we want that we don't have. Uh, and, and satisfaction, it's, it is hard to be satisfied sometimes. There's, there's more out there in this world, and we think that we deserve it, or, or at least we very much want it. And so the humility that it requires for us to, first of all, get into the sweet spot God has for us, and then to trust him enough to stay there, that's incredible. That's an incredible kind of humility, and it's very, very difficult. So it makes sense that the first list that Agar presents and that Jay Leitner presents, uh, Pay Leitner presents in his book is uh, things never satisfy. And in Proverbs 30, 15 through 17, it says, there are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, uh, the barren womb, land, which is never satisfied with water, and fire, which never says enough. The eye that mocks a father, that scorns an aged mother, will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley, will be eaten by the vultures. What's the point here? Well, um, Agar uh, suggests here that there are, are four things that are constant, that we will always have to deal with um, as a reality of this earth. One of them is the grave. We are going to die. It's a reality. We will die. This earthly body will cease. Now, Agar didn't have the Apostle Paul, Jesus, uh, all the things that happened in the New Testament to sort of inform us about that death, right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 about the mystery, which is that we, um, we may not all sleep, but we all will be changed. Well, that sleep time, right? What is that? The death that happens here on earth is the death of this earthly body. Our spirit, our souls go on to live forever with God. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at some point there will be a bodily resurrection of the, the believers, the faithful dead, and so we will be rejoined spirit with body, but not this body with a new heavenly body as we are raptured up to heaven with Christ. So death is a reality. It will happen to us, but as Christians, the great promise and truth of death is that it is not death to die. Dying is gain. Dying gets us, in, uh, you know, an opportunity for heaven. And, and so death should not scare us. It should be something that we are, on one hand, eager for, yet not in a suicidal kind of way. Um, it, it is an opportunity for us. Uh, the second thing that Agar brings out is a woman who can't bear children. And if you've ever known someone or maybe you yourself has dealt with uh, infertility, it is so, so emotionally scarring and challenging. And um, uh, I love the, the, the thing that Pay Leitner says here at the bottom of page uh, 52. He says, uh, the question we need to ask ourselves is how can we bring comfort and compassion to friends, neighbors, strangers, and family members who are hurting? Um, the reality here is that it isn't just a barren womb. It's grief. It's um, financial insecurity. It's um, broken relationships, <clears throat> divorce. It's abuse. It's uh, drug addiction. It's all kinds of things. And the question uh, that is ever before us is how can we help? How can we ease the burden? Um, you know, Jesus says that to us. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden. I will give you rest. How does he give rest? By allowing us to take his yoke and he taking ours. So the question really before us is how can we be yoke traders uh, for those whom are in desperate need? Uh, the thirsty land, obviously we know that when land is uh, barren and it doesn't have rain, it becomes dry and hard. And so it, nothing can grow there. The barren land is, I think, symbolic for what happens when our souls, when our spiritual lives are, are gone from God, are apart from God. We become barren and dry and hard and things can't grow. We can't grow. Um, and then fire. Fire is always before us and it's never satisfied. Um, and that's why we have to extinguish it, right? Because it will, it will not stop. It will go, 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 go. 
will always find more to fuel itself. And so uh, these are things that are always before us. They are never satisfied. And the problem of these things is that we are so much like them. We have been given so much from God. We have, um, we have more than we could possibly ever need. And yet we're still not satisfied. Uh, next week, we're going to look at list number two. Um, and we're going to continue to look at these lists over the next few weeks. I uh, hope you're enjoying this book. Um, I hope that you can take a moment to, to think about the humility that is required when we uh, have a desire to be in God's will and God's plan, and we have a desire to live there and dwell there, um, and, and what kind of humility it takes to stay there and not wander away like sheep do so often. Hope you'll have a great week this week. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great week.